It's, it's awesome what you guys are doing and building. And I appreciate you guys having me. So I, I'm very grateful. Awesome. And hey, John, do you think you can get that mic up a little bit more or get it a little closer to your mouth? Yeah. Should I talk like this? Are we good? Oh, yeah. Good, I'm good. Okay, no. <laughs> we good? We good. Does that sound better? That sounds oh, sexy, better. actually, a little bit. Oh, <laughs> stop. <laughs> so um, thank you for having me. And I, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak in front of all you guys about funds and why I, why I, I rather raise capital on a fund rather than raise capital for other people. And we'll get into that. And uh, someone, Charles, I think it was, Charles asked a great question. And I'll tell you, uh, he asked me, when I first started, did I go into LP? And, uh, and I, no, I didn't. I learned, I focused more of my attention as a GP and I dove right in on the GP side. But if I went to go do it again, because you guys already know that I'm a basketball referee, I would prefer to just LP for the rest of my career for the simple fact that I can focus on basketball full-time, basketball refereeing. I have high, high goals and aspirations at that level uh, to achieve, and that's what I want to focus on. So, uh, and another thing, another reason why the fund is more efficient, easier, and cleaner process for me to, to achieve that. Okay. So, well, John, let me, let me jump on it a little bit. Um, well, as, as you go for presentation, can you kind of touch upon like how and why you start investing in real estate from the beginning? And then uh, if you have ever raised capital in a traditional way and why you prefer fund now and why you made a switch kind of thing, can you touch upon that as well? Yeah, I've raised capital previously uh, in the past and I just don't like the process. Uh, also, there's legal parameters that I want, I want to avoid uh, in, 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 in retrospect to that because other groups were dinged really hard because they had like 15 people on the GP side. Um, so fortunately, I haven't been a part of any of those deals. But um, those, as you start coming into this side of the world and you start hearing things and you start meeting people, you know what groups are doing what and what groups are doing doing the right things and what groups are doing the wrong thing. So I, I avoid groups that are doing the wrong thing. And I learn from the groups that are doing the right thing. And uh, keeping a smaller GP party is crucial to stay in, a, to, to avoid uh, SEC regulations. So if you're being asked to raise capital on a deal that has 15 people in it on the GP side, one, you better run because you're not going to get paid anything. And two, you better run because the SEC is going to see that. So um, that's just a little bit of what I think, in my opinion. But also um, to ask, answer your question, how I started is started with one single family home. And while I was that under contract on that, I had podcasts and books, everything just screaming multifamily. And the podcast at the time, everybody says, well, eventually you scale and you move into multifamily. I said, you know what? I'm just going to move there first. I don't want to get 10 loans. I don't want to get 10 single family home loans and do this and whatever. I'd rather just scale now. And my second deal was a JV partnership. And that's kind of what I prefer to. And that's what the fund allows, a JV partnership where I can uh, partner with others and, and have a role and responsibility. And, and that was my second deal on 62 unit. And then my first syndication was a 41 unit in Chattanooga. Uh, and the 62 unit was in Johnson City, Tennessee. And Chattanooga is the 41 unit. And then the 528 unit is in Irvin, Texas. So those are my deals that I'm a part of, um, GP side. And also I've raised capital on two of those deals and I JV'd on one of those deals. And then going forward, I'm just sticking with the fund model and we're gonna bring the funds, acquire funds, uh, acquire our deals through the fund. So I hope that answers that background question. But now I'll, I'll dive right into the presentation. Awesome. Hey guys, if you have questions, 
we can do it a couple ways. He's going to be presenting. So if you want to just type questions in, we'll get to them by the end. But we're going to just run through the presentation and I'm sure you're, you're going to have questions. And then once he's done, we'll uh, hit those questions up. So just a, a little bit about my company. We're just a multifamily real, real estate investment firm. We only do multifamily. We don't do single, uh, we don't do um, storage, self-storage. You don't do mobile home parks. If I haven't invested in it personally, I'm not offering it to investors. So that's kind of how I think about it and how I go about it. Uh, this is just a, a little bit of the table of conference of contents of what to expect in this presentation. And, you know, I'll tell you about me, the team, our latest project services, how to get in touch and why we're here, the real estate fund. And Nico, if I, um, if I don't sound, if I sound too low, let me know and I'll adjust my volume. Yeah, you sound good, man. It sounds nice and clear. Uh, awesome. So a little bit about me. I mean, I think we could skip this. Um, we were, Nico gave the bio and I have a podcast and <laughs> yeah, we'll just skip that. <laughs> so a disclaimer that I'm not trying to sell you guys anything. I made that very clear when I, when me and Nico and Yosef were talking, I said, I don't want to sound like I'm pitching anything. I don't like sounding pitchy, so I'm not pitching anything. But this is just a legal disclaimer just to avoid all that since it's being recorded. Now, if you don't make money, if you don't find a way to make money while you're sleeping, you know, you're working till you die. And I strongly believe in that. And I think that's what we all believe in. So finding a way to create cash flow is basically all I ever look for. I look for opportunities to do that. And how I got here was when I became a basketball referee, I needed to create some cash flow because of the simple fact that my availability is my biggest asset. So if I'm working for Nico and Nico has a slate of games at a certain time and he gives them to me and I say, I can't work those games as an independent contractor, I lose out on those games. I lose out on that pay. I lose out on those opportunities. So going forward, Nico is going to think twice about adding me into his games rather than sending me the game and then I kick it back because I'm not available. So looking at the opportunities for cash flow, real estate really resonated with me and being able to create cash flow through, you know, the Jake and Gino philosophy, buy right, purchase right and uh, finance right. And you'll, you'll, you'll be able to cash flow and free up your time. And that was my biggest pain point. That was my bottleneck and was freeing up my time. So now that I free up my time, I can go ahead and officiate basketball games at will. Uh, so in 2008, 18, I started, I started with my first single family home. Then I purchased uh, the 62 unit. Uh, that's a little bit backwards, the 41 and the 62. The 41 came after, and then in 2019 was the 528 unit. And then uh, we had 167 unit that we partnered on as well, but, um, and that was the fun. So that's, that's where I'm going. And that was the last one I ever partnered on that I plan on partnering on uh, as far as raising capital. So <clears throat> I think we all know Robert Kiyosaki. And so the, <sighs> yeah. So reaching your goals and, 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 and the fund is going to help you build a sustainable business, for instance. So if I'm going to raise capital for a deal that Nico has, I'm going to get probably 3% on the capital that I've already, that I've raised. So if I'm raising a million dollars, I'm going to get 3% of that capital. That's how they kind of do the math on that as far as a acquisition fee. Right. So I'll get that back. But sometimes in the GP partnerships, your equity is really, really small. So you got to figure out how you're going to sustain your business because you got to now, now, now that you raise capital, you got to report to those investors for the life of the deal. So if the deal goes for five years, you're getting no cash flow for it from the GP side because typically in a value add deal, you are not getting cash flow until the deal starts performing. So when the deal starts performing, that's when after the preferred return, the GP can split that 70, 30 split or whatever the structure is after the, um, 
after the preferred return has been met. So a lot of times there's not enough, not enough room and for the other LPs, I mean, GPs to get a return up until maybe year two, three. So how do you bridge the gap? And creating a fund allows you to be a fund manager while receiving funds from the de- fees from the, de- from the fund, but you have to be performing in your, uh, for the fund to happen, so for it to work. So how do we get there? And we'll dive into that a little bit right now. So the team is, this is my partner, Mitch. He, ac- he actually is my personal accountant and he's actually the funds accountant whenever I create one. Um, he, he takes care of all the K-1s. So how that works is every day we invest in reports back to the fund. And then we, so if it's three deals, those three deals come back to the fund and then each investor gets one K-1. Traditionally, if an, if an investor invested in three deals, they would get three different K-1s and ask any investor. The K-1 is probably uh, you know, just an added extra process for their accountant to, 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 re, you know, to, to give to their accountant. So we like to make it easy and providing a fund model allows our investors to receive one K-1 through the life of the deal as we continue to invest in other opportunities with the fund. So uh, also we'd, all, we'd also include our attorney here, but since this is a presentation, we could use different attorneys for different funds. So we'd, we'd always include a section for our attorney that we use on, on our original decks that we use when we're uh, presenting our fund to investors or rolling out our funds to investors. So there's a core members of the team is we have people that we JV with, they find the opportunities. We, we like to have in-house property management, but if the deal works with third party, we will consider it. Also, what is your contractor and lending team? So how I like to look at, and this is what I tell investors, if the lender, if, if, the, if the deal that someone is offering you has great debt on it, your money is not as that not not as serious as the, as as the lender's money. So the lender's the biggest investor in the deal. So the lender will bring seventy five percent to the table. Now that tells me everything as a passive investor that the lenders are already vetted this deal. The lenders are already on board with it. Oh, and you you're, you're going to tell me that the lender wants to give me a capex budget as well. So that means I have to raise less money. So when that happens, it, you know, even, even if they're coming in with favorable interest rates, I mean, the lender already checked it out and vetted it. So they're already putting it through the, the toughest stress test in the world rather than you taking it and then going and underwrite it. So I'm not saying that for you to not do your due, due, due diligence on the deal. I'm saying that to say that, hey, if the lender's coming in at this, then all right, let me go ahead and do my checks on it and then make my decision on there. So that's the, the core members of the team. So this is what I my favorite slide because it's the five ways you can get paid in real estate. I don't know if you guys know Keith Weinhold. Uh, he, he, he actually, this is the first time I ever heard it was from him. And I've kind of like, I say it everywhere I can because I think it's, you know, everybody should hear it. My model is I'm trying to beat inflation 1% at a time. So basically I'm trying to preserve my wealth. Whatever I invest, I'm just making sure I get 1% or more. I don't want to break even because that means inflation probably ate, at, ate away at my capital. I want 1% or more. Actually, I want 2% because inflation typically... I think I have it here is 2% a year. So for every year that I'm investing in, I want at least a 2% return to break even. That's me. So I'm just trying to beat inflation 1% at a time. So I'm trying to get a three or more each year. Uh, appreciation historically through, through the years is 6% a year. So buying an asset today, 6% every year and exiting in five, 10 years. I like that the way it appreciates. 
especially if you're doing a value add component to it. If you're doing just a core plus still works. And if you're just buying for yield, what usually international investors come and come and do, they'll buy it at a three cap and they don't care because that's a better investment than they're getting back home. Obviously the cash flow is huge. I'm always looking at the cash flow, but it's not a deal breaker for me. Uh, I'm always trying to look for an opportunity to, to get the cash flow, um, but also, uh, but also make sure the deal checks out for me. So, the loan pay down is huge. That's another way you get paid in a deal because the tenants are paying down the bill, uh, the the mortgage. So, how that looks is, say you have fifty thousand dollars in a savings account and you're only making one percent inflation. You're losing money, and. In, how you're losing money is inflation is 2% a year. So if you're only making 1%, you lost 1% a year, right? The same way that works for your savings account, it works for your loan pay down. So let's say you get an interest only loan for two years. Well, let's just say you get an interest only year loan for five years at $1 million. So you're just paying interest for five years. That million dollars we took down, we borrowed today is not as valuable as the million dollars it would be when we pay it off in five years. If that makes sense, that's how inflation works. Um, yeah, that's the inflation works and it eats away at the loan pay down. So that's another way you get paid in, in real estate. And then the tax benefits, I mean, talk to your accountant. I'm not a CPA. I like to tell people that, you know, but there's definitely real estate tax benefits into this. And then wealth preservation is, you know, I'm just trying to preserve my wealth, beat inflation by 1% a year, cash flow. And I'm going to, the last thing on my checklist is rather appreciation. So that's my format. That's how I kind of think about it. That's how I go about it. Uh, there's advantages, the advantages for LPs into the, into the fund is um, the diversification. So Let's just say you have $200,000 and you're going to invest into two deals at $100,000. And then a fund comes about and the fund says, we're going to invest in four deals. I'd rather invest at least 150 into that fund and then go invest a, a, another 50,000 into, into something else. So the reason why is I like the diversification that there are if I already trust them and know what type of assets they're looking at, if it's value add or core plus, or even a core type of deal, and I already familiarize with their, with their type of investments and their track record, I'm comfortable with that, with that approach, because they're going to look for the type of deals that meet that funds criteria. Now, the preferred returns and the professional management and the tax benefits and the qualifications, that's all similar to a syndication. The only thing, a, a, real, a regular syndication, what I mean by that is a deal-by-deal -deal syndication, a deal-by-deal -deal offering. Now, a fund allows you to diversify strictly by one investment. If you're looking at a deal-by-deal -deal investment and you have that, two, that same $200,000 and you're gonna do two, maybe even four deals at 50 grand a piece, you're going to sit down and walk, look at four deals. You're probably looking at more deals than that, just to vet out between your favorite sponsors, favorite markets, favorite opportunities, whatever one shakes out the best for your criteria that meets your criteria. So think about that. You're going to do that four times with multiple, multiple investments to look at rather than investing in a fund where you already trust the sponsor and a proven a track with the track proven track record that goes back and does the same thing that you're going to do, but on a different level. So if companies that do have funds are sourcing deals, probably 50 to a hundred deals a quarter, if not more sifting through them, sifting through partnerships. I know for us, we have preferred sponsors where we already trust their track record. We already trust their, their partnerships because one, we've already invested with them in deals or we've already partnered with them in deals. So 
that's how I come about it. And another thing for me is, for me as a company, I won't invest with someone if I don't have a relationship for at least one year. And that's just a personal thing. I learned quickly who to get involved with and who not to get involved with. So I kind of, I have a thorough vetting process. So when you're going to these conferences and you're meeting people, it's easy to say, hey, Nico, let's partner. Da, da, da. You're a great guy. This is not, let's do it. And then next thing you know, I go, I go missing for like six months. And then I come back to Nico with a deal. And Nico's like, get the hell out of here, man. I don't even know you. I don't like that. Uh, so that's why the relationships that I have are tried and true. I don't have to be your best friend, but we speak. Like the relationships that I have with, with sponsors on my preferred sponsors list, we talk about our families, we talk about what we're doing, we talk about life, we talk about, you know, anything that could help, anything, anything. For instance, one of my partners, we were just talking about, he's going vegan for like the next couple of weeks or something like that. So it's little conversations like that. It's not about trying to just get together for a deal for the sake of doing a deal. I'd rather get to know you and trust you because I'm putting money with you and I'm putting other people's money with you as well. So that's, that's kind of where I stand with that. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we can skip that. And then here's, here's the fund structure, how we go ahead and do this. So you can see the diversification where if you look at the, the graphic here, the real estate fund and then how it invests into five opportunities. Let's just say this is a $25 million fund and we're investing $5 million a piece in each investment. And then the fund, each deal reports back to the fund and then the fund reports to the investors and then the management gets paid with the management fees and carried interest. One of the most common questions is, what if one of those sell, what happens? When, let's say four and five sell, we don't reinvest into another deal to go on four and five. We give our investors back their, their capital as we start to exit uh, from opportunities. And the reason why is we don't want to make this a rolling fund. We don't want to reinvest investors capital. We want to make sure that when we're out, we're giving it back, but also keep in mind, we're looking towards the next fund, which is going to be double what we already created in the past. So if this is a $25 million fund, and as we're starting to exit, our next one is going to be a $50 million fund or maybe even more. So the incredible investors, I think that might've changed, but hopefully that's spot on. Excuse me. So that, that I know for a fact is being discussed and talked about a lot lately in regards to, I guess it, some people feel it, it's a little bit dated and needs to be updated. So the SEC will go ahead and do whatever they do on that front. But th I believe this is the last known definition that I understood from that. And um, so the funds that I typically do right now, 506Bs, if everybody's, uh, if, if everybody understands syndication, there's a 506C and a 506B. A 506C is only accredited investors. A 506B is accredited and sophisticated investors, but only 35 non-accredited, which is sophisticated investors can participate in those deals. Right now we have, uh, how we're looking for, how we're, how we're maneuvering right now is our first fund is a 506B. And I'm, take, I'm thinking the next funds that we move on to are gonna be only 506Cs. Not for the simple fact that, well, let me dive into this. 506B, you can't advertise. You gotta have personal relationships. So you gotta have a, 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 uh, a good network. A 506C, you can cast your web, you can cast your net as far as you want to cast it through advertising and you can client, you can go into a crowd with a megaphone and say, I have an opportunity and blah, blah, blah. You can do whatever you want to do to advertise it. But at the end of the day, you have to vet those accredited investors. So there's a process with that. You can use your attorney that'll go ahead and give you a document that you can give to their CPA and they can, their CPA can say, yes, 
Uh, Nico is an accredited investor and we vouch for him and they can give it back to you. So you can have it on your record so that going forward, if something was ever, oh, if, if, if it was ever, I guess, uh, what's it called? Audited, you wanna make sure you got your ducks in a row. And the investment process is basically we're raising capital. It's going right to left, uh, left to right here. So we're going, uh, we're raising capital for the fund. And then we're going ahead and purchasing and negotiating and, and JV in with opportunities. And then we're doing the due diligence during that process as well. Oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. This is the, uh, this is the process of a syndication. So normally you go ahead and you source the lead, you underwrite, it goes left to right, I'm sorry. You underwrite the deal and then you gain exclusivity and due diligence and you get it on the contract or whatever you do, uh, you got an LOI. And then you, you, you get it on the, 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 the purchase and sales agreement. And as you're doing that, you're steadily, uh, when you get it on the contract and you know you're in due diligence, that's when you're starting to raise capital on the deal with your investors. So the whole process of a syndication is about 60 days and you got to have that money there at the end or else you're going to be uh, negotiating an extension. And each time investors, uh, investors, if the capital isn't there, the GP has to pay probably a, you know, they got to give something up to go back to the negotiating table to, to, to extend. So normally if you're putting in a one or two extensions into your original purchase and sales agreement, then say you need to do a third one because you're still raising capital, you're probably going to have to come out of pocket some way, some form, shape or form to go ahead and give you, buy you more time to take down the deal. But the investment cycle, as far as the fund, is we're for, we form a, we we can start raising on it, but we form, we um, we get the legal documents completed and gathered, and then we can start raising. And as we're starting to raise, we go and acquire, and then we we're actually managing these these operations through the through the fund, and then we actually reposition and then exit. And then we do the next fund over and over again. So basically it's a little bit different because we're getting the legal documents first and then we're going to look for the deals later. This one, you're finding the deal, you're getting it on the contract and then you're getting your legal documents and then you're bringing up capital. Basically you're just like trying to run through the red tape at the finish line and then taking that deep breath. Like, yeah, we did it. This one, you get the capital first and then you go and find the deals and opportunities. So it's like the chicken and egg thing. What do you want first? And a lot of people say, which one's easier? You know, have the deal and the money will come. That's a big lie. You only, the money will only come if you have a huge network. And I don't care who you are. You, if, you, if you have a deal and you funded it, it's because you had a huge network in the background. Um, because you found the deal and then the money came. So don't let anybody fool you with that. Now the investment timeline on a fund, let's just say it's a 10 year fund. You're going to spend the whole first year raising, acquiring and looking for deals. So once you meet a minimum, so let's just say you got a $25 million fund and you've already raised 2 million, let's say 5 million. Um, actually let's, let's put that at 2 million and your minute in your documents say, once you hit the $2 million mark, you can start deploying it. Once you hit that 2 million, you can start calling down the capital as you identify assets and going and invest in it. And then you keep raising and keep going. So there's a couple ways to call down capital when you commit to a fund. And the first way is you call down capital three days after they signed the, the PPM the private placement memorandum, and they sign the subscription. You can have them send the capital 
immediately and have your documents structure saying that there's leeway, some leeway time for you to go ahead and identify the assets. Or you can have it there as they committed. Now they have to be honest investors and say, look, John, I, I, uh, I know you need the money, but, uh, and I signed those documents, but I, uh, I already went and invested in something else. You sign those documents, you're committed and tied to that deal. So that's why uh, sometimes some people say, take the capital immediately, or I have other, other people that say, call it down as needed. So if we identify one deal and you only need, and, and someone invested a hundred thousand and your fund is already full and the first deal was 25% of the fund, just tell everybody to wire down 25,000. 25% of the deal of their uh, committed capital. And you can prorate it for any each investor just so that everybody's getting the same returns based off the capital they invested in. But there's different ways you wanna do it. Everybody's got different flavors or styles. You can find your own way and process it the way you wanna do it. Whatever's easier for you. We're actually calling down capital um, on later deals, but on the first deal where we're, we're taking capital as we raise on our first one. So I hope that makes sense. All right. Now, <clears throat> these are who we work with. Uh, we've just been beating the doors and getting our fund registered. And these are the type of individuals we work with. I like to work with private individuals. Um, you can go through platforms like Prequin, which has a bunch of pension funds, endowments, foundations, institutions, and insurance companies and universities looking to deploy capitals. And then I have some relationships with some family offices as well, which those are a little bit different. They like to JV partnerships. So at the end of the day, I'm gonna take my fund and go and purchase uh, my a strategy is take my fund and partner with a family office and we both bring capital to a deal and then we, uh, we JV into an opportunity like that. So those are different opportunities, different ways. But as far as pension funds, they're always looking, uh, pension funds, foundations, institutional investors, insurance companies, universities, endowments, they're always looking for opportunities to deploy capital. So usually if you have a big fund or even a small fund, it doesn't really matter. They're looking at the, just place capital uh, out in the, into the market because they have so much of it, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, so there's the, you know, obviously the, the five important elements is, is always the team is the most important. Who's the team? Tell me who the team is, I'll tell you if you're gonna win the game, right? That's, that's what we always think, right? But then you gotta play the game. So you gotta have management, which is gonna help handle operations. Who's gonna, help, who's gonna be on top of manage, uh, your management and operations. You gotta make sure you have a, a, a team member that is literally strong at that asset uh, and of operations. So making sure you're not a runner up, uh, uh, an asset. And I'll give you an example. Uh, on our 62 unit, when we purchased that, we went in and those leases were month to month. If you ever purchase an asset and the leases are month to month, and you know you gotta do three buildings, and I'm just giving you the, ex the example from my asset. We have three buildings, everybody's month to month. Get buildings two and three, leased up to six and nine month leases, and then go empty out building one and start working on it. Because if you keep everybody on month to month, everybody's just gonna leave on the next month and then you can't float your bills. That happened to us, true story, it happened. So we had four capital calls between us personal investors. That's why I learned the hard way. And I do it with my money before I invest other people's money first. So that's a little bit of pro tip of how to handle management and operations. Then you got to understand your market. Make sure you know what your market is. Uh, meaning like, what are the numbers? What is the PM charging? Uh, and don't try to get just cheap management just to get cheap management. Also, if you're going to, Go ahead and um, you got three buildings to do roofs. I love this example too is if you got three roofs to do, <clears throat> get company one to do roof one, 
get company two to do roof two and says, whoever does it the cleanest and not necessarily the cheapest, but if you save me a little bit, you'll, you'll win building three. And they will literally bust their butts to compete against each other. Competition is good for everyone when it comes to business. So that's another pro tip as well. And then, you know, the preferred return and the equity, that's for your investors. You got to stay true to your investors. And then the distributions, how are you paying that out? You know, is it quarterly? Is it monthly? You know, you can make the decision on your own fund. And these are the markets I focus in, Colorado, Texas, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Carolinas, Florida. Florida is Central Florida going up. I'm not, uh, I'm not doing South Florida, Christine. I'm not doing South Florida. <laughs> and then um, there's, um, those are my markets. But we have partnership and we have partnership, Georgia and um, Carolina. Sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> so we have partnerships in other markets. So if we came across the right opportunity in Ohio and it fit the, our fund, we have flexibility to be able to go out and, and partner with those in opportunities. So these are the target markets for now because of our partnerships. And then what we do and how we target, we target the value add, the under market rents, high vacancy, deferred maintenance and poor management. Financially distressed, the owners overpay for the property, making it difficult for them to cover their expenses. And then the physical distressed, it can't be, it can't be like an abandoned building, but the property has been neglected for years and we can go ahead and really add that value add component to it. And then the owner management distress is, it's just, it just makes sense right there. It's like, how are they performing? How are they, how are they handling their management? How are they, you know, they're not doing a good job. So we can go ahead and clean those up. And then the high quality, we like cleaner communities as well. So we cover our basis when we're looking at our investments and these are the type of opportunities that we're coming to buy. And with COVID, with a lot of people sitting out 2020, a lot of money wants to come back into the market, but also there's a lot of, a lot of uh, assets that owners really did a bad job managing during COVID. So we're starting to see those type of opportunities hit the market and we're gonna be able to take advantage of them with the fund. And then these are the assets that I mentioned earlier that we, we have, and we're in the middle of exiting from our 62 unit. The 41 unit, we exited from that successfully to our investors in 18 months of holding. So give you an example, investor, if an investor invested um, 100,000, they made a 1.5 multiplier on their deal. So through the cash flow and the exit, they made an extra 50K in 18 months. So that's just a, an example of, uh, and our exit on, um, on the 41 unit. And then these are the assets and then uh, the fund. It's, I can't speak too much about it. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. And then I, on the side, I do a little bit of consultant work with people, with other firms that are looking to create a fund, scale with the fund and you know, really make their firm work for them. So if you're, you're thinking about a real estate investment firm, consider a fund, consider starting a fund. If you know you're going to start raising capital eventually or get there, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not, if your firm's not focused on acquiring and just partnering, partnering, and, and you're going to focus on raising capital, I highly recommend a fund model because it's going to, basically sustain your business to be able to do this for, for the rest of your life. And I guess that is it guys. And there's my contacts. Any questions? Awesome, man. Yeah. we got some questions out there and it's funny. Once you start talking about the whole structure of how a fund operates, I see questions pop banging in, <laughs> you know, so people are curious, I guess we can start. Uh, Yosef, you want to start with a, a question? Or we can have people unmute themselves for, the que for their questions if you want to just call out a name or something, Yos. Uh, sure. You know what? Let's do this. Let's just, I want you guys. So, if, if, hey, John, can you stop sharing the screen so that we, everyone can see? 
everyone? Okay. And I'm going to just pinpoint from the very first question. And why don't you mute, unmute yourself and ask that question to Sean. So I'll start with this question. Where was it? Okay. My question was, if the fund has a holding period, I, I saw it. So I'm going to just skip it. All right, Nicole, you want to start with your first question? What advice do you have? Do you see it? Oh. You're muted. So with the holding period, some, some firms can do traditional six, five years syndications, or if I'm going to do a five year syndication, I'm just going to create the fund for seven years. And if it ends in five, <laughs> so be it. That's kind of how I think. So if I'm creating a fund for 10 years, my goal is to, to be out probably in seven or eight. Gotcha, thank you. And Nicole, you wanna ask your first question? I know Nicole, you, you, okay. you, you can like hear me five. now? Yes. Okay, yeah, cause I had my phone too. So my phone is where my audio is. Um, yeah, so I was just asking, um, what advice do you have when you're trying to vet sponsors, when you're first starting a fund and you're vetting your sponsors, um, even if you know them for a year or more, are there any other criteria that you look for in, in deciding which sponsors you're gonna work with and how they become like your preferred sponsor list? Yeah, that's a great question is, my preferred sponsors are uh, literally people that I, I've invested in with or I've partnered with, or I've so, I'm going to be investing in uh, with their next deal or opportunity. So, Here's the thing. If you have a fund and Nicole and you're a sponsor and I vetted you and I've talked to you for quite a while and we have a great relationship. Hey, Nicole, I have a $2 million fund and I want to deploy a million dollars into your next deal. Let me know if you want to partner on the next one. You see how it works. I mean, now you have, yeah. you're bringing some value to that and you get to, you know, you get to go ahead and, participate right. in the fund because the management company is going to participate in the GP or you can either JV the deal. So another thing too is if you're going to JV the deal, my criteria is whoever I'm JVing with, I'll bring 80%. They can bring the rest of the 20 and then we'll make it work. We'll talk about the parameters after that, but that's, I'm making sure whoever I'm partnering with has skin in the deal and it's not only my fund's capital. Okay, sounds good. The next question actually is mine too. So I'll just say that one. Um, so how early I was, I saw the timeline where you start building the fund, maybe like start raising the capital year one. Um, but then basically, are you promising your investors any kind of return? Like what's their motivation to want to invest in the fund if they not, are not getting a return during that holding period before you deploy it into a deal? You're mute. Oh, thank you. It all depends on what's in your documents, right? So uh, you could, we have a four month gap where we don't have to pay a return while we're holding the capital to look for the first investment. So that's what my investors are already prepared with and signed off on and they're comfortable with because they know that once we find something, as my mentor says, be patient because the, you know, just because someone brings you something doesn't mean you have to jump on it. So be, be patient with investing and rolling it out. And investors have to understand that being patient will be able to hit a lot more doubles, singles and doubles than, than anybody. Um, because at the end of the day, we're not looking for that one home run just because we, take in the capital. We're not looking to hit a home run with it. And that if you keep that philosophy and mindset, your, your investors will understand. Plus you're going to keep them updated with your quarterly reports. So let's say you have raised the capital and you haven't found a deal yet. Be honest with your investors. And then when you finally do find a deal, go back to your investors and say, we, you know, we're processing distributions. 
and we're not taking a, a distribution on ourselves and we're going to give it back to the investors. Make your investors love you. There's, you can be so creative in this that you don't have to make a return every time for yourself. You can skip a quarterly payment of yours because the fund is going to be worth it for everybody. So it's all about how you approach your investors and interact with them. That's a great question. I, okay. Also, she was, you know, how do you get them to, you got to give them some kind of numbers, right, John? You got to be like, well, you're going to get, you, you, I mean, they don't want to jump in thinking that they might only get 2%, right? Well, actually, what's funny is I know, I know some funds that offer 2% when they're holding, but Excuse me. Sorry. Um, I know some funds that offer 2% when they're holding and, and the money's dead and not being put to work. It's just dry powder. But you can, you can give them 2%, give them 1%. It's all, it's all about what you're willing to do and what kind of account you're going to put it in while you're holding it. So it's per your discretion, what your investors are going to trust from you. Do you tell them in advance, John, like, hey, this is, or, or show them a track record of what you've done and what kind of returns you've produced in the past and not promise anything, I guess? Yeah, our fund, uh, when we're rolling it out, it has an 8% preferred return, 70-30 split. So once we get the ball rolling, uh, it's a 13% IRR at the fund level. So I always tell investors, when, it's, when it starts looking at 13, 13% is where I start looking and anything after that, if someone's telling me like 22% IRR, I'm like, come on, man, come on. That's, that's insanely high. I'd rather you under promise over deliver. Um, don't try to blow me away in the beginning. So I try to look at it from, like I said, if I wasn't doing this, I wish I was just an LP forever. But the fact that I was just thrown in, like I, my curiosity got the best of me and now I, I'm just going. So... <laughs> I think like an investor, how would I want to be told? How would I want to be structured? So I tell them, you know, this is what we're going to do for the first until we identify an asset or when your investors sign up, they don't have to give you the capital. You don't, you can always call it down when you identify the asset. So you're not responsible for that, you know, that dead period. Thanks. Let, let's move on. I think I'm gonna, I could skip my question as it's just answer. Nicole, can you mix typical fund with crowdfunding? Uh, you mean raise it through crowdfunding? Uh, like a mix or like and, do some kind of, yeah, mixture because in case you want to get non-accredited investors in or sophisticated investors, but then like you said, you have to have a big network because you can't advertise. <clears throat> but with crowdfunding, I know you can advertise. So I didn't know where that line was drawn. Yeah, I do all 506Bs and I've had one 506C where it was only accredited invest. Well, I haven't had any of them. We only accepted accredited investors in the, in the 506B. Um, you got to remember that if you're going to the crowdfunding platform, I think they charge a fee. I've stayed away from them. They charge you a fee to, uh, to put your funds on there or whatever you're, however you're raising. When GPs go to their, their platforms, they're paying them a fee too. So you got to bake that into your returns when you're offering. So going private is my favorite. But as far as prequin, prequin is just a, that I mentioned earlier, it's just a platform where uh, fund managers go and they, they look to network because they're looking to vet other fund managers and who's doing what what their type of funds. So I'll give you a good, a good idea of uh, there was a pension fund and they have it categorized where they're looking for 25% of their pension fund to go into real estate and everything else into all these different other areas. So they're looking for the fund managers and building relationships through that platform to go ahead and invest in those type of opportunities. So if you get the right connections, that's not a crowd a, a crowdfunding site. So it's more like a networking site where you go ahead and you can register your fund on, but network with these companies that have these huge, massive, you know, pension funds for schools and firemen and all of, uh, name, the, name the industry, they're there. 
And they're just networking with each other, finding out who the best operators are and trying to network and grow their, their pension funds capital because that's what they do. That's, that's what they're hired to do for their, for their funds. So you can join communities like that, but as far as mingling, you got to pick one, 506A or 506B. You can't just say, hey, I'm a 506B, but I'm going to put it on this pub public platform. I don't know how the SEC would take to that. Good. Thank you. Um, Patrick, you had a question? I want to speak up? Yeah, hey, sure. Yeah, great presentation. Thanks, Jim. I just wonder what it, um, how much it typically costs to start a fund um, in terms of you know, what goes into it. Yeah, the attorney fees. So think about when you're creating a syndication, you can pay attorney fees anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000, depending on who the attorney is to create the legal documents. Uh, the syndication attorneys, if you're going ahead and doing the deal, like a deal by deal, when you identify the deal, you're putting the documents together. Typically when you're putting these deals together, you're putting the money up front, but you're raising that back out of the deal, uh, out of the fund. So if you're, if you paid an attorney twenty five thousand, your fund is going to pay you back that twenty five thousand. That's great. And then in terms of like any SEC reporting, like how much cost is involved with that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a, 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 a I believe it's a yearly expense that we got budgeted into the fund. But um, if we go back to attorney at the end of the year, say hey. We got, you know, there's blue sky laws that you got to follow with investors with different states. And you just got to get that price up front because if you know you're going to take investors at all across the country, or if you got investors just in your market, you just got to worry about your state. Got it. So it's wrapped into the fund costs. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have another Nicole question. I think she's coming, Nicole. Keep them coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is this one now? Oh, I think this one was like a answer to already spot your first fund. Oh, yeah. Let's get comfortable. <laughs> what was that? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. That's down further. Oh, uh, yeah. How they can get, um, how do you get your investors comfortable with investing if they don't know what the deals are going to be that you're um, going to potentially look for? Great question. Track record helps. Also, spot, preferred sponsor lists help. Also, the type of investments you're looking to do helps. And my favorite one is, if you don't have any of those, my favorite one is, these are the last four deals I personally invested in. And these are the returns I'm making. I'm raising a fund to go and invest those type of deals also. So, Personal investing, a lot of people, for instance, if you came to me and was like, oh, look at the last four deals that I invested in. It's like people were telling you the crypto craze, right? So, oh my gosh, I made this amount. Oh, really? How are you doing that? Da, da, da. Let me know when you see another opportunity that you know you're going to jump into. It, it's just the same thing like that. It's word of mouth. And people love, love when you're doing the actual thing that you're potentially pitching them on. Mm -hmm. And sorry, just to follow that up, but if you are, um, the returns that you're promising for the fund, like the 8% preferred 730 split and stuff like that, are you actually like looking at deals that have a certain parameter above that so that you could still offer that return to the fund? Yeah, that's a great question. So if I'm going to go in and and on a syndication and I'm on the management side, I'm gonna try to negotiate. So if I'm bringing $2 million to a deal, I'm gonna try to negotiate a 10% preferred return for my, my fund. Uh, hopefully I can get that. I'll, I'll settle on a nine, maybe. But if, um, if I'm JV and I'm looking for a 10% return, also I'm looking for uh, you to bring skin in the game and we're gonna negotiate based off the, the criteria of the, of the deal. So that is a very great question because you got negotiating power. So Thank John, you. Uh, 
kind of a related question. And I think you, you mentioned about the, uh, uh, the preferred return. In terms of the split itself between the funder and, and the sponsor, uh, what is a good benchmark? It means I've seen splits all over the places, 80, 20, 70, 30, and then waterfalls running into 50, 50, and 60, 40. Uh, how, should, uh, how should we think about it? Uh, how I see it is this, this is my personal opinion. I know that there's sponsorship groups that are 50, 50. That's awesome, great for them. Um, because they, they earn that. Their credibility speaks volumes. So as long as you're getting the returns on, on that type of an experienced sponsor, that I'm, I'm okay with that. But it also goes the other way too. If you're giving away the farm because it's your first deal, how comfortable am I going to be because this is your first deal? So a while ago, I was asked to go and raise capital for a deal where it was a 86, 14% split. And they were just doing it just to, and it wasn't their first deal. It was like a 348 unit. And I'm just like, there's, there's nothing in it. No, they're, they're giving everything to the investors like, like it's my first deal. It wasn't, it wouldn't have been my first deal. And I just didn't think like for the investors. Yeah, that's great. But why is it 84? Like the numbers just threw me off. Like if it was an even 80, 20, all right, maybe, you know what I mean? I'm cool. But 80, 80, 84, 16, 86, 14, whatever it was, I'm like, nah, man. Uh, it's just, it goes the other way. Right. So if it's an experience and they're taking more, I've heard of experienced sponsor teams taking 60% and 40% to them, the LPs. But as long as the LPs are making their capital and the, the GPs are performing, I'm okay with that higher volume, but also I'm okay at 80, 20 with the proven sponsor team. But I just feel that 70, 30 has been what I've taught, what I've been taught. And it's just been the common standard practice for me and the investors that I've come across. And I don't know, I mean, it, it's, all, it's all different because each sponsor can do their own thing. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions, Jay. You had a question about penalties? Yeah, it's kind of, uh... First of all, thank you, John, for presentation and great information. Uh, and thank you, Nico and Yosef, putting this together tonight. And that's awesome. Uh, the uh, the question, first question I had was uh, just a follow by Nico. So that was kind of like how to make the investor being comfortable. So uh, we can skip that. But the second question I have is um, the uh, also newbie question, but um, I know the answer already, but the uh, how do you get the loan approved when the property is distressed? Like, for example, a burn building, part of a partial burn building. And I know the bridge loan is there, but for during this time, um, especially like everyone want to play safely. So, yeah, that's a great question. So, you're, you're definitely going to go bridge to the permanent debt. So, you're the fact, like agency debt's not gonna probably touch it unless it's a great opportunity. But uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not trying to purchase an abandoned building, but if, if there was a fire in it, one, I'm gonna ask the, <laughs> the previous owner, why haven't they repaired it, right? So I wanna know why, what do they use their insurance money on? Have they gotten insurance money on? That tells me that if they haven't, then they don't have enough adequate reserves to be able to go and fix it while waiting for the insurance money. Um, it's just little little things like that that I'm gonna ask before going in, but say I was to be comfortable to acquire it, it's definitely gonna go bridge to perm. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. And with bridge, I'm gonna try to negotiate the least amount of interest, uh, the interest rate, because typical bridge is 9%, 10, 
uh, trying to get that down as low as possible. If I can pay extra points on it, that'll be great. But it has to be part of the underwriting. So if, um, if it fits still with the bridge, with the interest rate, that, that's all that matters at the end of the day. Uh, and I like to underwrite my deals for the whole term, except if that's the, the scenario. I hate underwriting uh, with the investors expecting or telling investors that we're looking, for instance, if a deal comes across my desk and it says, we're gonna refinance in two years. To me, two years, a lot can happen and there's no guarantee so I want to see what the deal looks like if I can underwrite it without no refinance. But on a deal like we are talking about, there's got to be a refinance involved. But if it's a regular value add type play, I want to see what the deal looks like number wise without a refinance because the refinance to me should be the icing on the cake to say, oh, hey, John, you know, you just got half of your money back because we refinanced, even though uh, it wasn't part of the business plan, we just found that it was a great opportunity. So a great business, a, a great business plan to me, always will consider it, but doesn't, doesn't hold the whole value or the weight of the deal on a refinance. And I know I kind of went the other way because we were talking about bridge and refinancing out, so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Last question I have is Charles. Charles, can you um, unmute yourself and speak up? Oh uh, yeah, hey. Um, so I just had a question as far as um, like, what would be two rules that you would say to never violate as far as raising capital um, outside of like legalities and all that? Uh, yeah, so stay compliant, man. <laughs> There's no two rules. It's just always stay compliant. Like, um, I think, like, for real, Christine can vouch for me right here where she's introduced me to investors while I was raising on a deal. And I would come out straight up and say, I, I would I'd love to talk to you, but I can't let you invest in this deal. And that right there is probably my number one thing. I'm, I got a family. I'm not trying to go to jail for raising capital for you. You know what I mean? So I'm just trying to do it the right way, the legal way and stay compliant. Oh, that answers your question. I know it's not two things, but stay <laughs> compliant. <laughs> hey, it's just the bottom line. It's the truth, man. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way around that. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, the, the, the meeting is recorded. All right. So we're going to uh, send it out to everybody via email. Also with all of John's contact information and his website and everything. So if you're interested in learning how to start your fund, he can consult you through it. Uh, if you're interested in that or having more conversations with him, uh, reach him through the, the email that we're going to send out. Sometimes you got to check your junk because uh, I use MailChimp and sometimes it goes to junk, but if, you, if you're using your cell phone, you'll get, you'll get the uh, email. This will go out tomorrow, probably, or maybe the next day, but you'll look out for an email. And guys, we got to give a warm, I don't know how we do it, like an air hug or a virtual hug to Mr. John. Thank you, man. There we go. <laughs> thank you, John. Hey, thank you. Everybody, thank you for your time.